Hi, and welcome to A Cup of Tea with Stephen. Well, it's Pride Month, as we know, and there's no Pride March in London or Brighton, but hey, there's Pride in here, and we're going to bring a little bit of Pride into your house now. Um, my guest today with her numerous television, film, and theatre elders embodies everything that's a gay icon. Moist is her word du jour, when she's not douching with mint, or thinking of it natural zinc, darling. She's currently hosting the chat show Wonder Birds, with the likes of Sherry Houston, and it's absolutely fabulous to have Harriet Thorpe along today to chat about Pride and everything that's going on in her life. Hi, Harriet. Okay, that's so cool. Oh, oh, oh so exciting to have you here. I love the cup. Thank you, darling. What is that in the corner? Mm -hmm. Little cat. Little cat, darling. I, mean, I have dogs as well, but I'm also a cat lady, just I, saying. I really need one of those. Well, it's so nice to have you here. And listen, you, you must know how many of the LGBT community just adore you and love you. You're, you're a, a, a gay icon. And uh, what does pride mean to you? It's the most wonderful celebratory experience for everyone to be free yeah. to be who they want to be. But I think we must never forget the endless struggles and fight to get there and yeah. to also know that that fight isn't over all over the world because oh there are still God. huge issues. For us, it's a day of joy and celebration or a week of joy and celebration or a month of joy and celebration. But for others, they can't even own the right to stand up and say who they are. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you've seen the Peter Thatchell documentary on Netflix, Hating Peter Thatchell, it's called. But it goes back no. to when the, when, this, when the march started, and uh, you know, there was a small group of people being taken down by the police. Mm. To what we have. Yes, I have seen it. I have seen it, absolutely. It's just, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just, uh, it's incredible how far we've come. But again, as you say, places like Iran, people are hung for being gay, or boy, there's just... Uh, Pushed off buildings. I mean, people are not free to have their voice and I think all, and that's the important thing to remember yeah, that we have this day this time of celebration and encourage others to understand and move forward yeah. and you know, one of the wonderful things about you is that people always see you as this fabulous theatrical camp figure but uh, I know I know basically you, you, you're a very proud mum and you've got a gorgeous handsome son and uh, and what did you teach them about diversity? I also have a, a gorgeous, beautiful daughter. Yeah, but I've not seen her, you see. I've not met her. I met your son. Darling, have you not looked at my social media? What are you doing? Of course. No, They're both said. I, 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 I'm sorry if I apologize if I haven't seen him. I've seen your son. Maybe I've got a one-track mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> diversity. Not for me to say, darling. <laughs> but listen, what, what, what did you teach them growing up about diversity and the LGBT community? Well, it's really interesting that you should say that because I didn't have to teach them anything about it because it was all normal. And that's the world I grew up in. Yes. And my mother, Gillian Freeman, wrote what is now a gay iconic book called The Leather Boys, which was about working class boys, biker boys, who yeah. fell in love yeah. in 1964 when it was still illegal to be gay. Yes. Yeah. So in the world that I grew up in, it was normal for men to love each other, for women to love each other, and for men and women to love each other. The Leather Boys is quite an iconic book, isn't it? I mean, uh, uh, it was an iconic really... novel that yeah. then turned into an iconic film with Rita Tushing and Dudley Sutton. And again, as I say, it was so important for people when it was still illegal to be gay, which we can't even imagine today, to have that voice. Also, she wrote the film, which was the first film, it was Anne Hayward who played a young boy transitioning to a girl. And it was called I Want What I Want, written by Jeff Brown. Yeah. And again, that was a very important film. And she was specifically asked to do that because they knew her understanding of the world. John Dexter directed the film. And, you know, it, it, was, it was so important because again, it was unimaginable to people. And I remember the writer coming to our house to talk to my mum mm. about it because mm. again, nobody understood, nobody knew. It wasn't, it wasn't common knowledge. It wasn't something that was every day. Well, and now people are still finding it hard. But that's what I'm saying is I grew up in a world where it didn't matter where you were from, what yeah. religion you were, what your sexuality was, it was all normal. So the same applies to my children. Yeah. You are who you are, yeah. you have your voice. And just be happy yeah. and it's easy to say 
because when you step out into the world, as I did, that's when I discovered yeah. in my primary school racism, racism, homophobia, you know, um, sexism, um, misogyny, and anti-Semitism. And that's all there. I have to ask but you. in your own home and my parents' friends, it was normal. And it was for my children too. So I didn't need to teach them anything because Which it was all fun. Where her knowledge from? Uh, well, what was her background? Is she was able to write things like this? Because it, it was quite a band school. I think my mother, was, my mother was an extraordinary person. Her father was a doctor. My grandmother was an extraordinary woman. And it was interesting. My great-grandmother was one of the first women to ride a bicycle around Maida Vale in the Victorian era. My grandmother did a degree in her 40s. And so again, it was a time of change where women were beginning to find their voices. And both my parents, you know, um, were on sort of um, freedom of speech and liberation for women marches, you know. Yeah. So my grandmother and my grandfather were understanding people. You know, they, my grandfather was a doctor, ultimately became a dentist, but saw life death all the time. Yeah. And you realize then acceptance and freedom and encouragement and support is everything. Who yeah. am I? Who is anyone to yeah. judge anyone? When you're busy, as this famous saying, when you're busy pointing the finger at somebody, there are three pointing back at you. Cool. So, you know, it's not about judgment. It's about acceptance. And again, in the arts, yeah. we have that. It's part of the people that we are, whatever art form you're in. It's about acceptance, especially now. And in the past, you could be who you wanted to be and you were loved and accepted for who you were. But playing a gay character back in the day uh, could be the kiss of death for people's careers, couldn't they? Uh, of course, of course it could. Of course it could. And that's because of the bigotry and the fear. Yeah. When people don't understand something, they're frightened. Yeah. And once you understand, but then you look back to Greek history, there was a story where, you know, you were, you were together with your partner and yeah. these people used to be um, together and cartwheel around and some of them were, men some of them are women and some of them are men and women and that's why you're always looking for your partner in life yeah. and that's greek history yeah. so it, people understood it better then than yeah. they do now oh they do they do indeed you you trained at central school of speech and drama along with I Jeff did. Saunders and uh, don french i yeah. mean it's an it's a, a, a incredible school um what what, uh, what what do you think give you a good foundation in your craft and uh, do you think it's something that's important as an actor to go and train at drama school i well, interestingly i i teach at lots of drama schools but i don't think there is one way to be or one way to do anything i adored it i was at the royal ballet school before my tits grew, couldn't get them into a tutu, never gonna happen. Went to Rombert, still, you know, not gonna happen. And yeah. so then I went to drama school and I was very fortunate to go there. Um, and it was wonderful for me because it gave me my voice, but I don't think it's a prerequisite to success. If there was an equation for anything, we would all do it, darling. Yeah. People go to drama school and don't work people, don't go to drama school and don't work people, go to drama school and work people, don't go to drama school and work. It's just whatever is right for you. And there is that famous phrase, which I use all the time, is go where you're wanted, not where you want. Well, you're well loved, but what would you say was the biggest misconception of you? Well, I think people always think, oh, they live this theatrical life, which we are blessed to do, but we also have real life. And the thing that matters to me more than anything is family and my friends. Yeah. And it isn't always theatrical. It isn't always all those things. It's actually just wonderful neighbours and chatting to pals. And, you know, yes, we do have wonderful nights out on the town and a laugh. And as I said, we share the non-judgmental, accepting world that we're in. But also, I need real life and I need the things that are my foundation, which are, which is my home, my friends, my family and my neighbours. And you've just worked with Joan Collins, haven't you? Yes, I played her daughter. <laughs> was that fun? <laughs> oh, how could it not be? It was sensational. You know, you just you'd spend your time curtsying in front of her. She was wonderful, generous, funny, uh, you know, anecdotes galore. Yeah, she's got a one-woman show coming back again, which I've seen. Which was, which was, <laughs> but anyway, you, you've done absolutely everything from the Royal Shakespeare Company, you know, Ms. Mum. Darling, can I stop you there? Can I, let me stop you there. I have never worked for the Royal Shakespeare Company. 
Um, I'm not bitter. They just never chose me for anything. So I have to stop you there. I worked at the National Theatre. That's funny. Right. Keep it in. And so I just have to tell you, darling, oh, you know, what sadly they've not employed me as yet, but there's still time for a Shakespeare Company. Employ me. Well, you did the Holt Mill Theatre uh, <laughs> to, to mm. MAME, uh, which was a huge hit, I understand. It's really a small theatre, isn't it? Um, what, what's your, what's your it is the only fringe theatre. It's the only fringe theatre in Manchester yeah. and fantastically important. And the two guys who run it are absolutely extraordinary and innovative and entrepreneurial to have created this wonderful space where you can put on the most extraordinary shows. You know, I, was, I haven't been up to see it yet, but did my friend Denise Welsh go, is a big, big uh, campaigner for it. Uh, what, she's, what... A, she's a patron for them, as is as is also Tracy Bennett, who was, of course, Maine. Yeah, got got rave reviews. Uh, what 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 was your, what's been your favourite part, and what would you like to play still? <laughs> Well, I know it's, it's so fascinating to think about it because in the moment, whatever you're doing has to be your favourite part because of your emotional commitment to it. You're doing it eight times a week, or if that's if you're doing theatre. Um, I've adored all of them, and they're all mad, psychotic women, whether it's Morrible, Tenardier, Love It, you name it. Um, and But I think my favourite has to be Vera Charles because... It's just so glorious to play that role. <laughs> would you like to do what you'd like to bring it into the West End? Yes, I mean, we were offered straight into the West End, but unfortunately, um, with everybody's various uh, commitments, it couldn't happen. But I don't know, who knows? <laughs> well, listen, you were in the first series of Ab Fab uh, and, you know, my God, did you realise that was going to be such a success? I don't think you ever know. You don't ever presume. What you do is you're just present and you have a good time. It was always the most hilarious, fun, friendly, fantastic atmosphere. And no, we didn't know at all. You can't know. But it's been over 25 years of utter joy. What was your happiest memory of the show? Well, I have a couple of memories. And first, I was talking to Jen about it the other day because we were all on holiday. Uh, the two families were on holiday together with our kids. And I remember her saying to me, Darling, I, you know, she said, oh, she didn't, I'm, I'm the one who says darling, she probably said Harriet, um, I've got this idea for a show and it's about this. And I said, well, I can play your daughter, darling. I'll just strap my tits down, that'll be fine. She went, no, absolutely not. But, um, and so that was a very happy memory of her first thoughts and sharing her thoughts about it. Yeah. And um, I think it, it's just always fun. And I think all the outtakes, which you can see, obviously, of all the things that go yeah. wrong are, are my favourite moments. Because it's like laughing in the classroom. You know, you know you shouldn't laugh, but you can't help it. And it's the most exquisite feeling. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think there'll be a number two film? I don't think so. No. I don't think so. I think, um, you know, it is, I don't know. One can always hope and never say never. But I have no idea and, and I've not heard any rumblings, so, you know. Be nice. We really like. I mean, I enjoyed the first one. It was good. It, it, it was. Mm. Do you, you know, uh, everything's got so PC now. People are frightened. Of, uh, comedians are frightened now. Uh, do you think that Abfab would be commissioned now if the idea was put up? I think people are not as brave as they were, and I think, again, with British Empire, with Abfab, they took time to. You know, British was allowed to evolve and to develop. Yeah. And characters were allowed to blossom and flourish. And nowadays, if you don't get your ratings, your pull, nothing is allowed to evolve naturally to find its feet. You have to go in, hit the marker, and if you haven't got enough hits on social media, you're gone, or whatever it is. And I think that's a real shame, because if you look back, all the shows that are successful, not that there aren't wonderful successful shows, of course there are, but others have been allowed to evolve. Yeah. And I wish people weren't so frightened and allowed things to be like that today. Yeah, if you look at the history of things like George and Mildred and uh, Hilda Baker, if you watch them now, they, you'd be horrified. Mm. Uh, because they'd, they'd be taken off air after that, if they got on air the first night. Of course, of course. But also, you're gonna, that was the era. You look at all of those sitcoms and you realise how appalling it was. But um, the sort of underlying racism culturally was there but again you know it, it's sort of yeah. thank god that that part of it is gone yeah. but that doesn't mean you can't be 
vibrant and funny and out there. And there are wonderful shows on now that are absolutely in your face, often online, that are free to say what they want. I was thinking about the show Wonderbirds that I'm doing, that we've been running for over a year now with uh, Sherry Hewson, Dee Anderson and Debbie Arnold. Um, We do it three or four times a week. And again, we're not censored as we might be on television. So if we swear, we can swear and talk a load of old bollocks if we want to. You know, it doesn't matter. Again, the restrictions, there's more acceptance and freedom online, you know. Of course, yeah. Yeah. But then if then equally being well known, if you say anything wrong, it could be all over the Daily Mail the next day, couldn't it? But but, but why, again, the reality, yeah, you're absolutely right. But who would ever, why, why would people want to say anything wrong? I mean... If you say bollocks or for fuck's sake or whatever, <laughs> doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. It's not yeah. Mary Whitehouse Day anymore. Oh She's long gone. And yeah. all the ridiculous nonsense that she projected onto things that were innocent and funny and important, she was horrendous. I'm sorry, Mary, yeah. but yeah. you were. Um, and so those days are gone. It isn't acceptable to be racist, homophobic, you know, anti-Semitic, um, anti-Muslim, anti-anything. Um, it's not, but you can still be free and be funny, yeah. and that's not about being any of those things either. You cannot do that, absolutely not. Well, listen, I was going to ask you about what Wonder Birds has become like a little bit of a cult, cult kit already. Um, how did it come about, and do you plan to take it into the studio now we're all uh, out of lockdown? I don't know if we will. I don't know. It started because Debbie Arnold rang us all and said, I've got this idea, and we all four of us chatted, and then we were talking about what name should it be, and you know, Dee's parents created Thunderbirds. And I said, well, why don't we call it Wonderbirds? And then that was how the name arrived. So, and we've all, every single one of us, created this show from Debbie's idea. I named it, but that's nothing to do with anything because all of us have created the show together yeah. and, and its identity and its fun. And we, I think we've had something like 9 million hits in the last year. And it is about talking about things that people are frightened to talk about and having a laugh and just saying things aren't okay sometimes. And, you know, and also a lot of nonsense, which is lovely. And we've been privileged to have a lot of guests who are absolutely fabulous. And we're doing a live show on the 28th of June at the Duchess Theatre at 7.30, get your tickets while you can. Um, And that will be with some lovely guests as well and just having a good time. I'll be the first time you've done it live together, will not it? The Duchess Theatre show. There's the first time you've you have done. Oh yeah, of course. We've ne- we haven't done a live show, but it, again, um, we go live often online. But it's not like being actually together in the flesh. We've never done that. It's sort of bizarre, really and yet, fun. yeah. We were saying today, you know, I'm always busy before a Zoom call, and I've done it again today. And I said on the show today, I'm always busy, you know, putting on perfume before my Zoom call. <laughs> it's perfume for a Zoom call. I mean, I put perfume on it every day. Yeah, anyway, you're a lady. But I do it for a Zoom. Prepare themselves, and uh, <laughs> I, feel, I, I would never, I would never do a Zoom call without having a shower. <laughs> you see, but would you, would you always put aftershave on? Yeah, I always put on a bit on each day. <laughs> yeah, and a bit on before a Zoom because I'm, yeah, I'm busy I always, I always putting it on for a Zoom. I always, I always but listen, what are you, what are you watching uh, on the television at the moment? What's your favourites? <clears throat> oh, that's really interesting. The show I was very moved by which is about women getting revenge on men who have abused them was um promising woman oh it's a promising woman yeah is it is it i um, seen it i want to see it it's it was... it's it has it's it's just that start of somebody saying no and you know i guess there's lots of vengeance films but it was it was it's quite witty in parts very moving in other parts and devastating in other parts. So it, it's interesting. I love Gogglebox, especially the oh, yeah. um, celebrity Gogglebox. I love that. Uh, what else do I love? What else do I love? Um, well, I just think any comedy. All I want to watch is comedy because it keeps me buoyant and happy. Are you I don't want real life. Thank you. Are you watching RuPaul's Drag Race? <laughs> yes, I adore RuPaul's Drag Race. My favourites are <laughs> Bianca Del Rio and Davina De Campo. I absolutely adore them both. But I adore all of them. So I hate to be a judge, I'm afraid. Yeah, of course. Um, What's your idea of a perfect night out? Mm -hmm. Well, doing a show, obviously. Um, And then post show, it would have to be going to um, one of the Corbin King restaurants because they are fantastically reasonable in price 
fabulous yeah. food, amazing entertainment, and every restaurant you walk into is like walking onto a wonderful set. And um, I would love to go to one of those. And then, of course, to the Ivy Club to have a twinkle, my favourite cocktail of all time. The, the one the, I love, it. I love a little tinkle after afterwards as well. As well worth. What it's not a tinkle, darling. It's a twinkle. It's a what? A twinkle. Twinkle. Tinkle. Tinkle is something you do in another room. A twinkle is what you do at the Ivy Club, babe. And it's it's vodka, champagne, elderflower cordial, and a twist of lemon. Oh, it's a drink. Okay. I'm getting it. <laughs> uh, I'm not paid <laughs> enough to give anything away, dear. That's not <laughs> happening. Do, 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 um, uh, what are you working on at the moment? What, what, uh, what, uh, what uh, you're, you're filming at the moment? I see. I'm working on a, a fantastic film directed by Nick Winston, who also directed Maine, and it's a musical, and um, it's called Tomorrow Morning. It's an extraordinary story, which has a kind of six-year journey, and you flashback to the beginning of something and also the end of something but I can't give anything away I don't want to do any spoilers but it's okay. joyous are you filming in London or are you, are you, are you, are yeah that? we're filming in London and around yeah oh that, that, that that's that, that that's absolutely fantastic listen do you have a, you... And I've been so lucky I've been so lucky because I did Midsummer Murders before Christmas I did an episode of Endeavour in uh, sort of February, March, and I've done an episode of Doctors with Helen Ledra, my AbFab cohort, um, very recently, which I don't think comes out till September, but I can't say any more either. And um, and now I'm doing this wonderful film. In the autumn, I'm doing Hilary Bonner's new show, um, Dead Bonner, Lives. Oh, I love Hilary. Uh, and, uh, Brilliant. Uh, she's she's big inspiration to me, and Amanda, of course. Uh, the, yeah. The, the, what the wonderful oh that's great i, I love hillary i'm gonna we're gonna do yeah. a with hillary i just did amanda so we do hillary and i'll be, I'll be absolutely terrific having her on she's, she's oh she's they're awesome. they're wonderful and she her writing is fantastic and it's the most wonderful thriller it's really really good of oh, question when you're working with he uh, helen is it is it difficult for you both not to slip into ad fab mode when you when you're together we don't really because we're pals and again she was also at central yeah so we've all known each other for so long and our friends so ad fab is something yes of course it's there and we're lucky to have been fleur and catriona for yeah. all this time yeah. but um just being on doctors together was such a hoot and we had such a laugh and you know we're just pals the great little series doctors actually i mean there's no it is day, amazing day, so sometimes i miss it but i think mean, everyone i know has been on it so as a, as a real listen um do you have a message for all your lgbt fans uh, uh for pride you'd like to say my message to everyone for pride yeah. is darlings have an absolutely fabulous time you deserve it oh thank you so much for coming on it's been really good fun uh and i'll, I'll speak such a pleasure Happy Pride.